very good evening to all of you friends i welcome all of you to facebook live challenge on the anesthetic society task this is our 20th presentation on uh, facebook live challenge and i hope all of you are enjoying it today we have with us uh, dr tushar dikshit he is consultant anesthesiologist in liverpool he is in nhs that is national health scheme by uk he is going to present about adjuvant analgesia is it a balancing act or it is it a polypharmacy basically nowadays concept of uh, opioid free anesthesia is emerg emerging or opioid sparing anesthesia and this adjuvants are useful to reduce the requirement of opioids but sometimes it becomes polypharmacy so it should be a balancing act and uh, dr tushar will throw light on this topic and i am sure he is uh, he is going to enlighten us with uh, some new things and uh, we will learn something new from him he is in uk so it is duty hour for him uh, so he has recorded this presentation and sent it to me so we will play uh, live through my facebook wall so i hope all of you will enjoy it thank you tushar thank you very much Good evening friends colleagues and audience on this live session my gratitude to tas for giving me this opportunity and thank you dr hetal for this challenge i duly accept this live challenge and i will try to do my best the topic that i am going to discuss today is very dry and it is dry because it involves discussions about medicines and it does not involve discussions about those magical uh, medicines which suddenly make you feel better we are actually going to discuss drugs which have little effect but when combined together form a pharmaceutical orchestra and they these drugs are actually very common some things we use on day to day basis now before i start i'd like to show you my credentials I'm a consultant. I work in the northwest of England near the vibrant city of Liverpool. You must have heard of Liverpool about the football and the Beatles, but apart from that, it is a lovely city with some very good hospitals. I also work for a charity called Mercy School of Anesthesia, which provides FRCA exam preparations. My special interests are regional anesthesia and perioperative pain. I also indulge in a lot of onco anesthesia as well as orthopedic anesthesia and I am involved in teaching and education as well. I'm the departmental lead for preoperative services, perioperative medicine and trainee induction program. I'd like to make certain declarations. I am not a pain specialist and I have minimum experience in managing chronic pain patients that can comes under the realm of the specialist pain doctors some of the pictures here i've taken from the internet now the drugs i'm going to discuss you all probably have heard of them so don't accept any sort of enlightenment all i'm trying to do is to bring everything together in one place and i apologize if i'm telling you something which sounds very simple and obvious So let's talk about some basic principles. Incision is when it all starts. The surgeon takes a knife, puts a cut on the body, and that starts a chain reaction. There is neurogenic inflammation. There is reduction in the nociceptive threshold and upregulation of receptors, as well as the ion channels that causes peripheral sensitization. Now these are the words we use all the time. Uh, especially in the pain side of things sensitization now this will eventually lead to increased production of various substances chemicals enzymes within the dorsal root ganglion also there is activation of nmda receptors and glial cells causing central sensitization and the wind up phenomenon this will eventually lead 
lead to neuroplasticity, which is a change in the neuronal structure with potential transduction signal enhancement. And this is the mechanism of how chronic pain develops. And this is quite important to know because if you look at the pathway, patient comes in electively for an operation, we do a surgery and we give them a lot of pain. Then we deal with that pain by using strong painkillers like morphine, any other opiates, uh, nerve blocks, epidurals, spinals. And some patients will develop chronic pain. And this leads to an overall deterioration and poor quality of life. Now let's talk about preemptive and preemptive and preventive analgesia. What is preemptive analgesia? What it means is that the intervention is put in before the surgical insult starts. What I mean is that the analgesia starts before the surgical insult begins. So if you look at the pathway, preoperative intraoperative and postoperative and this is the patient the operation comes here and the analgesia is placed before the intervention so a general anesthesia and part of general anesthesia is analgesia and that is preemptive we are doing it before the insult has happened now the objective is to prevent central sensitization and hypersensitivity reduce hyperalgesia and reduce the incidence of post-operative pain. Now this is achieved because of the suppression of the central sensitization and the wind-up phenomenon as I discussed before. Unfortunately, studies have not proven this to be extremely effective. Lots of work was done in late 1990s and early 2000. Uh, and the groups involved were Monique, Dahl and Ong. And there were roughly 200 RCTs looking at effect of preemptive analgesia. Resul results were actually quite contradictory. And then in 2005, an idea was floated in anesthesia analgesia by the Kissing Group that stated that surgical wounds are capable of inducing sensitization. So even if you have run somebody on an epidural for a couple of days, there is a chance that they may still develop central sensitization. And the understanding was developed that it's not the timing, but the duration and the efficacy that is more important for post-operative pain control. Now, what is preventive analgesia? You look at the same patient pathway, surgical insult, and you still do your same preemptive analgesia if you want. But analgesia must also continue at all other stages, intraoperatively, postoperatively. What I'm trying to say is that there is no single silver bullet. What we cannot say is an epidural is enough, or spinal shot is enough, or a syringe of morphine is enough. And here I'm going to give you an example. If you have any interest in Marvel comics, there is a character called Thanos, who is meant to be the most powerful being in the universe. And soon it, it was realized that to kill him, you need lots of people with different skills. And that is why a team of Avengers came together. And this is quite akin to multimodal analgesia. You're using lots of different drugs to target that big pain which is Thanos. And this is because pain physiology is extremely complex with a lot of receptors, ion channels and pathways that are involved in the pain pathways. And that is why I wish to talk to you about the concept of adjuvant analgesics. Now, is it a treasure or a treachery? The reason I say that is I am not against opiates or against epidurals. 
I'm not trying to undermine anybody else's role. These are tried and tested techniques, have worked for many, many, many years. Doesn't mean that there is something wrong with those techniques. All we are saying is that I think we need to look at a broader aspect of pain and add a lot more drugs. Now, adjuvant analgesics are also called co-analgesics. Now, this is quite similar to co-induction during anesthesia or co-loading of fluids. They were originally marketed for indications other than pain. The potential benefits were discovered by intention or by accident. They are potentially a misnomer. We can use them for primary analgesia as well. It is a very diverse group of drugs and they have a synergistic action. I will focus my talk on perioperative analgesia but I will also take the liberty to discuss a little bit about cancer pain and a tiny bit about chronic pain as well. So why do we need them? I've mentioned some of the points already. But as we know, opioids can lead to hyperalgesia and as well as acute intolerance. Central sensitization, so patients can develop chronic pain. And in those patients, your standard analgesic techniques may not be that effective. Patients who develop, develop chronic post-surgical pain. Acute neuropathic pain is something controversial and that's an issue between the chronic pain physicians and our acute specialists to resolve. But I feel we are talking about the same thing. Risk of acute pain turning into chronic pain is high and that can happen very quickly. For example, amputation surgery. Chronic neuropathic pain, which is the bread and butter for our chronic pain uh, colleagues. As a part of multimodal analgesia, adjuvants are very effective. And with the evidence behind preemptive and preventive analgesia, our adjuvants are very effective. They can be used at each and every step of the WHO ladder. So you look at our pain ladder of mild, moderate and moderate to severe pain. And actually, you can use these adjuvants in somebody with very mild pain or as rescue analgesia in somebody with severe pain. So they have multiple roles. So today's objective, we're going to talk about adjuvant analgesia for acute perioperative pain and brief mention of neuropathic cancer pain and a one quick slide on headaches. So for perioperative pain, we are going to discuss the drugs that affect all the pathways, or most of them at least. NMDA receptor antagonists, gabapentinoids, local anesthetics which work on the sodium channels, alpha-2 adrenal receptor blockers, sorry, alpha-2 adrenal receptor agonists, glucocorticoids, antidepressants. We are not going to discuss regional anesthesia non-steroidals and paracetamol. Let's talk a little bit about ketamine and I personally use ketamine for a lot of my patients. Nociceptive stimuli cause glutamate release from excitatory synapses. Now what happens? This will activate the NMDA receptors in the central and the peripheral nervous system resulting in the voltage dependent flow of sodium and calcium ions into the cells and potassium out of the cell. Now as I've said before, NMDA receptor activation has a key role in the development of central sensitization, wind up and pain memory. Now this results in the chronic pain or pathological pain state. This can eventually be manifested clinically as hyperalgesia and allodynia. Chronic opioid consumption can also produce changes in the nervous system which are similar to that we see with central sensitization. They activate the mu receptors which can increase the effectiveness of these glutaminergic synapses 
at the level of NMDA receptors, which results in opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Now let's look at ketamine. It is a usual, useful adjunct in abdominal, thoracic and major orthopedic surgery and there is good evidence to suggest that. It's level 1 evidence. They can be used as an adjuvant to opioid analgesia. Again, strong evidence for that. They are quite helpful in opioid dependent chronic pain patients by reducing pain intensity and opioid consumption and that can last beyond the perioperative period. Rescue analgesia, it is quite effective in theater recovery and sometimes on the wards. And it provides preventive rather than preemptive analgesia. The evidence for chronic post surgical pain reduction is mixed at the moment. Now, you don't need big doses of ketamine, actually. You need just sub anesthetic doses uh, uh, which block. The NMDA receptors in a non competitive manner. And that's all you need to prevent the central effects, hyperalgesia, and wind up phenomenon. There is reduction in pain intensity by 20 25%. Opioid consumption is down, and the opioid related side effects are also reduced. Personally, I use ketamine IV at the dose of 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram on induction. And I continue somewhere between 10 to 30 milligrams per hour. Postoperatively, we usually prescribe ketamine as an oral 10 to 30 milligrams maximum, up to 30 milligrams QDS postoperatively. And ketamine as a patient control analgesia is very useful for opiate dependent patients. Magnesium. This is the magic drug, isn't it? It's a jack of all trades, but it's master of none. Magnesium needs to be replaced if somebody is deficient of magnesium. But we also use it as an analgesic, but for its other multiple effects as well. It's a neuronal stabilizer, it's cardioprotective, and it's lung protective as well. But we have to be mindful that it can cause muscle paralysis or prolonged muscle paralysis. Now, gabapentinoids. I'm not sure what the situation in your own workplace is. In the UK, the gabapentinoids are only licensed for chronic neuropathic pain, epilepsy and anxiety, which is for pregabalin. There are, they are actually being used as an adjuvant quite a lot these days. Gabapentinoids mainly act on the alpha-2 delta-1 subunit of the presynaptic calcium channels and inhibit neuronal calcium influx. This results in a reduction in the release of the excitatory neurotransmitters such as glutamate, substance P and calcitonin gene related peptide from the primary afferent nerve fibers therefore suppressing neuronal excitability after nerve or tissue injury. So let's look at pregabalin. You need to look at the risk benefit for major painful procedures such as sternotomy, thoracotomy, arthroplasties and spinal or spinal surgery. Now, a lot of patients who are coming for arthroplasties or spinal surgeries are actually already on some kind of gabapentinoids, which are started by the primary care doctors. The evidence for any benefit for minor laparoscopic or day surgery is actually um, quite poor. They are useful as a preventive analgesic and prevention of chronic post-surgical pain, and the evidence is pretty strong. Side effects may include dizziness, sedation, meiosis, vomiting, and visual disturbances. And the lowest dose is around 300 milligrams. Gabapentin, on the other hand, decreases pain intensity at rest and movement with improved functional recovery. The evidence is level 2. 
there is decreased opioid consumption, there is decreased opioid related side effects, but, sed but sedation and dizziness may be increased. It has been found to be better than placebo, but not as good as other adjuvant analgesics. There's a moderate reduction in the chronic post surgical pain, just like pregabalin. It also provides preventive analgesia. Personally, I'm not a big user, but if a patient's taking it, I always make sure to continue it. It is used in various units in different facilities as part of the pain package. Uh, it's used quite commonly for phantom limb pain in vascular surgery. And that is what I was talking about, the acuteness of neuropathic pain. Now let's talk about my favorite topic, which is intravenous lidocaine. You know that lidocaine is an amide local anesthetic and a sodium channel blocker. It is effective as an analgesic, and that is because of the suppression of impulses generated from injured nerve fibers and at the proximal dorsal root ganglion by inhibition of sodium channels, NMDA, as well as the G protein coupled receptors. There is good evidence to show that it's an anti inflammatory. It reduces neurogenic inflammation and intrinsic inhibition of cytokines, as well as granulocyte migration. It is an anti-hyperalgesic and it does that by suppressing peripheral and central sensitization potentially by its anti-inflammatory effect. And it tends to work on the pain producing pathway, so the pro-nociceptive pathway as compared to opiates which work on the anti-nociceptive pathways. It is a class 1 antiarrhythmic and it can prevent bronchospasm as well as cough reflux. IV lidocaine is a neuronal membrane stabilizer. Usually the doses used is 1 to 2 mg per kilogram and then 1 to 3 or 1 to 2 mg per kg per hour depending on where you read it. It has a half-life of 1 to 2 hours with a high hepatic extraction and high hepatic clearance. It is excreted renally. The therapeutic plasma levels is 2.5 to 3.5 micrograms per mil. Toxici toxicity tends to, tends to start above the plasma levels of 5 micrograms per mil. And toxicity is actually related to blood concentration uh, and is dependent on the dose, speed of injection, acid-base status, plasma proteins, liver functions. Um, and it... And rarely there is hypersensitivity or tachyphylaxis. Now, the CNS symptoms tend to start above 5 to 6 micrograms per mil plasma concentration. And they tend to usually start with tongue numbness, metallic taste, lightheadedness and tinnitus, followed by visual disturbances that progress to muscle twitching, unconsciousness and seizures. And this will eventually lead to coma, respiratory arrest, and cardiovascular collapse. But the most common complaint that I find in my practice is when I give the bolus. And they can produce, and lidocaine can produce, sometimes ketamine-like psychotropic effect. Bit of sedation, sleepiness, lightheadedness, relaxation, euphoria, unreality, feeling of flying and drunkenness. If we continue to give the wrong dose, plasma levels cross 10 micrograms per mil, there is a risk of cardiovascular toxicity, which can be negative inotropic effect or effects on conduction, leading to a widened PR interval and QRS duration, uh, sinus tachycardia, sinus arrest, or AV dissociation. There is also an effect on vascular tone. Blood pressure can actually go up before it goes down. And these can all be potentiated by acidosis, hypercapnia, and hypoxia. So, in terms of evidence, there are many meta-analyses done in 2008, published in the B British Journal of Surgery and Can Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in 2010 by the Vignold Ferguson Group, which have shown the improvement in the visceral pain and post-operative bowel function after abdominal surgery. 
There is reduction in pain and opioid requirements. There's reduction in nausea, vomiting. And very importantly, this reduction in the duration of ileus, resulting in the decreased time to pass flatus and feces and leading to early rehabilitation and discharge. It is extremely beneficial in enhanced recovery after surgery, but the evidence for non-abdominal surgeries is lacking. My personal practice, I use boluses and I use infusions. For bolusing, I use 1.5 mg per kilogram bolus over 2 to 4 minutes. And I, for infusion purpose, I use the Ottawa regime, which is in paper from Naveen Ipe, Tofik and Penning. It is extremely effective for both laparoscopic and open surgery. And that includes a mixture of fentanyl, ketamine and lidocaine, drawn up to 20 ml syringe and infused at the rate of the lidocaine, which is 1 to 1.5 mg per kg per hour. So for example, for a 70 kilo patient, they get a 100 mg bolus and followed by this mix being infused at the rate of 100 mg an hour or 10 mils an hour. Let's move on to alpha-2 agonists. Most data suggest moderate effect on nociceptive pathways. But problem for me personally is the side effects and we don't have access to dexmethetomidine in my hospital. So I'm more uh, used to using clonidine and there is a risk of hypotension and bradycardia. Now POIS2 trial in the New England Journal of Medicine 2014 looked at aspirin and clonidine on uh, uh, short-term and long-term outcome and safety after perioperative aspirin and clonidine for non-cardiac surgery. There was no reduction in mortality and increased risk of hypotension and non-fatal cardiac arrests. There is no effect on preemptive analgesia. Intrathecal and epidural administration is a good adjuvant in acute neuropathic as well as cancer pain and this is because it increases the duration of the block. Now I personally use clonidine in younger patients who can potentially be quite agitated in recovery and it keeps them nice and sleepy. I tend to avoid using them in older patients unless analgesia and blood pressure is a problem and they have, they have hypertension along with pain issues and that's when I've used lower doses of clonidine. Now let's talk about neuropathic pain I, I, and I apologize again to my chronic pain colleagues. Uh, forgive me if I say anything wrong. But in my experience, from what I see in the outpatient setting in the clinics, that the best evidence there is is for tertiary amines, uh, tricyclics, such as amitriptyline. Um, but also, nortriptyline is being used and the newer drugs, um, or as we call them, the atypical antidepressants plus the SSRIs and SSNRIs um, have been better tolerated as well. Duloxetine is better than gabapentin for apparently chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Anticonvulsants may be used to treat all types of neuropathic pain. Now, experience with gabapentin is extensive and quite favorable. There are many other drugs with diverse mechanisms and the patients with refractory neuropathic pain are potentially the candidates for anticonvulsant trials. And actually, you've got to use different kinds of anticonvulsants to find out which is the most suitable for any patient. There is a range of anticonvulsants. Gabapentin is used commonly anyways. And there is a favorable safety profile uh, and, uh, and supportive controlled studies in post-herpatic neuralgia, diabetic nephropathy, sorry, diabetic neuropathy and trigeminal neuralgia. Now, 
before I move on, my practice is limited in terms of anticonvulsants, but on a couple of occasions, or more than a couple of occasions, we have had to use IV phenytoin in theta recovery for somebody's pain who we could not control. And this was taken on advice of a chronic pain specialist. So it can be occasionally helpful in some acute and chronic pain conditions. Let's look at local anesthetics for neuropathic pain. Now I'll just fly through this slide. We know that IV lidocaine can be effective for neuropathic pain and uh, occasionally we have had to give IV lidocaine in patients who have quite severe hyperalgesia and recovery. Um, and uh, 2 to 4 milligram per kilogram over 20 to 30 minutes, slow bolus, uh, slow, slow infusion with monitoring uh, using telemetry uh, was quite found to be quite safe and it helped the patient quite a lot. Obviously, as I said, risk of toxicity is high, so there is a requirement for telemetry and specialist input. There are a couple of miscellaneous drugs which I'd like to show you. That's calcitonin and baclofen. Calcitonin has been usually tried by the intranasal route and it has been demonstrated to be a reasonable analgesic in a small group of patients with complex regional pain syndrome or as we call the reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Baclofen has been established as an analgesic for trigeminal neuralgia as well as some other types of neuropathic pain. It needs to be tapered before discontinuation because of the potential risk of seizures. Topical adjuvant analgesia, again this is completely chronic pain uh, territory, but as part of an adjuvant analgesic, lidocaine transdermally or we call Versatis patches um, have been used quite successfully for localized pain. We, in my hospital we have the service for capsaicin patches. So this is similar to what we say in Hindi, Jale Pe Mirchi Lagana. What it means is it depletes substance P from the terminals of afferent C fibers. Okay? So lower doses have been used for moderate pain, but the 8% capsaicin patch is used for severe pain and the effects can last for several months. These patients have to be kept in recovery because they sometimes get a lot of pain from the patch itself. A very brief word on cancer pain. Now dexamethasone is something we use as an antiemetic um, as well as something which potentiates the effect of a regional blockade. But as a, for cancer pain, it can be quite useful for neuropathic pain, bone pain, obstructive pain, as well as headaches as a result of raised ICP. Drugs which I've already discussed, antidepressant drugs can be used for chronic cancer pain patients with low mood and topical adjuvants can be used for focal cancer pain for example lidocaine capsaicin patches as well as anti-inflammatory gels. Alpha 2 agonist is a trizanidine which can be used for opioid refractory pain with failed first line adjuvant analgesia and some emerging evidence on cannabis and cannabinoids the THD spray for refractory pain as well as advanced cancers. The research is uh, uh, out in the open. There's not much uh, uh, consensus at the moment and there are issues of safeguarding and safe use. Botulinum toxin is an adjuvant analgesic to be used for refractory focal muscular pain and bisphosphonates and denosumab which inhibit osteoclastic activity and thereby can reduce pain from uh, bone bone pain from bone mats. Large number of adjuvant analgesics are used in the prophylaxis of frequent vascular headaches or in the management of chronic daily headache syndrome. Now, apart from the non-steroidals and opioids, the standard drugs, beta blockers like propranolol, anticonvulsants like valproate, gabapentin calcium channel blockers like verapamil, alpha-2 agonists, antidepressants like amitriptyline, some vasoactive drugs like isometheptane, and ACE inhibitors like lisinopril have been used. 
I hope I've highlighted to you the different drugs that can be used and those drugs that can make a part of a multimodal treatment. I believe adjuvant analgesics have an important role to play in multimodal analgesia. You all have heard this Buddhist proverb, pain is inevitable but suffering is optional. I hope you will agree that managing pain is like walking a tightrope. We are juggling with physical, psychological, emotional and spiritual needs of the patient on one hand and a lot of drugs on the other hand. I hope you will think of multimodal analgesia next time you do a case. Keep safe and keep COVID free. Thank you. Best wishes.